in the discussion of uh, ways of knowing things and the objects that are known, we touched on the uh, division between conceptual and non-conceptual cognition. And uh, these uh, points introduce us into the topic of what's called generalities and particulars or oh. instances. This is, uh, these are terms, particularly this one, uh, generalities, which uh, is uh, quite difficult because there are many subdivisions uh, within it, and it's really hard to find a term that uh, satisfactorily works for all of the, uh, the types that are here. I think that if we want to describe a little bit uh, better what uh, is really uh, involved here with these generalities, that we would say that they are mental syntheses. In other words, uh, through some sort of uh, mental uh, process, one synthesizes or puts together various things into some larger entity. We have sometimes uh, the term mental fabrication sort of uh, made, but uh, we don't necessarily have to actively make it or synthesize it ourselves. Let me just give a, a, a very simple example, like uh, animals. We don't have to uh, go through every single instance of uh, every creature that somehow we uh, want to put together into one group and then uh, having gathered them all together then we say okay I'm going to call all of these animal it's not that we actively have to do it and we're not talking necessarily about naming them we're talking about putting them together in a group giving that group a name is something else and uh, some, I mean, it's very interesting uh, how we learn these uh, groups if you think of a, uh, a small baby a small baby puts almost everything into the uh, group of edible you, know, you can put in your mouth, doesn't it? But uh, later it has to learn that uh, there are certain things that don't really belong in that group. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's not go into uh, this whole uh, uh, very interesting topic of how we learn these groups. But uh, a synthesis also doesn't always work. I mean, sometimes the word category, sometimes the word generality... We'll see with the different uh, kinds what we're referring to. But in Tibetan or in uh, Sanskrit, there's there's one word that refers to all of this. So what it is, is uh, it's a phenomenon, what we're talking about here, is a phenomenon shared in common by the individuals on which it is imputed. It's like the definition of it. Hmm. Right. I'm not quite sure what the German word yeah. Nachvolt means. Yeah. What does it mean? A follow more or less. It follows. Well, what does follows mean? That means that it's imputed. That's what I mean by a, uh, a mental uh, uh, synthesis. We have all these individual beings, these creatures, these things, that walk around or whatever, and uh, we put it all together and we impute on it Right, let's uh, project onto it a group, a category, animals. So it's imputed on it. So das ist auch was ich meine. Wir haben labeled onto it, but labeled doesn't necessarily mean verbally. Anyway, let's not worry about uh, what word is used in uh, either English or German for this. The point is to understand what we're talking about. You got the idea. I mean, this is very important. Otherwise, uh, it's hard to uh, go further. Think about it for a moment. Remember, we use this word imputed in terms of uh, me on the mental continuum or age in terms of, uh, you know, the continuum. So we can impute onto uh, a group. It could be a, a temporal sequence. It could be just a group of things all at the same time. We can impute on them either something which is functional, which changes from moment to moment, or something which is static, which doesn't change from moment to moment. We're not talking about a group. We're talking about what's imputed. What we can impute on it can either be something that changes from moment to moment, like age, or something that doesn't change from moment to moment, like uh, the category animal. You follow that? 
Clear? Some people are shaking their heads. No. What is age? What is age? Or time, for that matter. Age. Or a year. The, uh, a year is yeah. a good example. What's a year? Does a year happen all at once? No. We have day after day after day, 365 of them, and what is labeled or imputed on that, to put it all together, is a year. Does the whole year happen at once? No. What year is it now? 2010. Is that happening? Yes. Is the whole thing happening? Is das no. Ganze jetzt passiert? Nein. The 2010 is imputed on each day of the year. And it's changing from moment to moment, isn't it? Yeah, because it's passing. Now 100 days are past of it. Now 101 days are past of it, etc., etc. So how much is left? I mean, all of that's changing from moment to moment. Even after... 2010 is no longer happening then also it is changing from moment to moment it's one year ago then it's two years ago then it's three years ago that's just imputed then there are things that can be imputed that don't change we have a dog we have a fish we have a bird right and we can impute on them animal and that category doesn't change does it now do you get the idea of uh, something imputed and it's something that, what should we say? A mind doesn't have to be somebody's mind, but just in general, me- mental activity, in a sense, makes up, doesn't it? We make up these categories in order to understand things, in order to deal with them, don't we? Like animal, or machine, or age. I and mean, that becomes an interesting question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Do animals have a concept of age? An interesting question. But do animals age? Mm. Well, do they actually? I mean, this is interesting, isn't it? <laughs> There's a sequence. There's a sequence. Well, they have an instinct. Maybe that's not a very good example. <laughs> Fish. I mean, whatever. My point, or, you know, before. Way, way back in ancient times, was there a concept of age? Was there, well, was there a concept of machine? No. Was there a concept of tool? Not not necessarily, not necessarily. But they did various things, and then they, somehow a group decided on the convention that these all, you know, are similar enough that we'll have a category for them. It's a mental synthesis. Okay, now. What are the different types that uh, we have? We have some that are a uh, functional phenomenon and some that are static phenomenon. Okay, so we have, uh, we get to these, these are not so easy. First one that I'd like to discuss is the the functional ones. Okay, and so we have, uh, or maybe, I mean, it's difficult to follow exactly what uh, you have uh, here. Let me follow my own way of dividing it, it becomes a little bit uh, easier for me to explain. Okay, so we have uh, the term that I often use as a, a category. We can use generality. There are a category of generalities in reference to conventional objects and some that are in reference to language. When we say the term generality, I don't know if the German word has this connotation, but sometimes in English it has the connotation of being vague. It's not vague. You know, in English, we say, oh, I have a general idea of that. It's very vague. Mm-hmm. We don't mean it in that sense at all. It's very precise. Okay, now, in reference to uh, conventional objects, we have uh, some that are uh, functional phenomenon here. So the first is the third in your list, collection, meant, uh, a collection synthesis. Right? So you have here a general collection. Right, so it's a, a collection synthesis. It, what it is, is referring to a whole, a whole which is imputed on the parts. Right? What is a whole? When we have parts, don't you have to synthesize onto it a whole? Oh, the whole year, right? The whole year. The whole we did it the whole year. That also is synthesized on the parts, imputed on the parts. Or a forest. 
forest is uh, imputed on a whole bunch of trees. But if we're talking about functional phenomena like trees, then the collection of them, the collection synthesis, a forest, you know, just as the trees change from moment to moment, the forest can grow bigger, the forest can grow smaller. So when we even a big you know, it, it, the forest changes from moment to moment, doesn't it? But it's a collection of parts, imputed on the parts. Right? Okay. So then the other type of uh, functional category or synthesis in connection with conventional objects, you know, with regular things, is a kind synthesis, what is called here the first one, Algemeine Gattung. That's a general genus, I think you would, you would yeah, say. Yeah. So with this, we are, uh, it is referring to, now we're talking about the objects themselves, what sort of kind of object are they? You know, what genus do they belong to? What species do they belong to? So it could be a machine, it could be an animal, it could be a computer. We have the whole computer, the computer has a whole object imputed on all its parts. And uh, it can also be a, there are many different kinds of uh, computer. Remember, we had our black Dell and we had our gray Apple. So they all, we can impute on both of them the genus or, or type of thing that they are, the species, <laughs> I mean, that doesn't work with objects, but in any case, the kind of thing that they are, they, as this computer. And uh, do computers do anything? Do they change moment to moment? Can a computer type this and type that? Can a computer process or process that? Can a computer break? Not alone, unless you press the button and go away. And it <laughs> whether it does it, but, you know, whether you need to help it or not is something else. But the computer does something. I mean, now you get into all sorts of uh, causality questions here. <laughs> the computer can't do anything. Cause for a computer doing something is an agent that makes it do something. What allows us to do anything? Oxygen? Um, <laughs> food? You know, there are many things that uh, operate. <laughs> so that's a whole different question in terms of causality. It's very interesting if you think the difference between a computer and a mind. You need someone separate from the computer in order to operate it and make it work. Do we need someone separate from a mind in order to make it work? No. no. But this is the concept of a soul that is refuted in Buddhism, that it is separate from the mind and that it somehow operates it like operating a computer. Okay. So we have uh, a collection synthesis and a kind synthesis. There are other aspects here in terms of a whole. For instance, uh, does a sentence, it has parts, but all the parts aren't uh, existing at the same time, are they, or happening at the same time. Each word is, when you hear a word, each word, each syllable is happening at a different time. When you're hearing the second syllable, the first syllable, you're not hearing anymore. So it's a synthesis over time. So when we have a collection, synthesis, a whole, for instance, of the computer, it's not only synthesized on the parts, which are all happening at the same time, mm -hmm. but the computer doesn't exist for just one moment, does it? So we can still compute a, the whole, a computer as a whole, as a collection, on the computer over as long as it lasts, totally. Even though from moment to moment it's getting older and getting closer to breaking down. But still, we have this collection synthesis, this whole computer. And it still stays as a computer. That's what it is. And what about sense information? What do we see when we look at uh, the computer? We see a colored shape. Right? Three-dimensional, like a, uh, um, a box, a flat box, uh, black box, my Dell. Well, box is making it into what kind of thing it is. It's a black shape, but a computer is not just a black shape, is it? So we impute on it that it's a, a computer. Well, my friend is using a computer in the other room, and I hear the tip, 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 tip sound. Am I hearing the computer? Yes. So we can impute computer on this sound. I'm a blind person, or even not being a blind person, I'm holding the computer in my hand. 
touching the computer. So I have a tactile sensation of a physical physical sensation. Is that the computer? Is that a computer? Yes. So a computer is also a collection synthesis on all this uh, different type of sense information as well, the sense data. Right? That's what we call a conventional object, a computer. A conventional object is uh, what is imputed on all the different senses, what each, the information that each of our senses gives, plus all the parts, plus the sequence for however long, long it lasts. That's the conventional object, the computer. Okay? All our objects, everything that we see are like that, aren't they? So, in terms of uh, objects, conventional objects, we have uh, these type of uh, syntheses. You know, the collection, sort of like the whole thing, and what genus it is, what kind of object it is. And now we have uh, an object mental uh, synthesis. I mean, here we have uh, different types here. This is a little bit uh, complicated. Object, object mental synthesis, I think, is your number two. Tunji, your general picture you have here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, the allgemein is... Okay, this we really have to understand. This term has to do with a mental process, with a conceptual thought. Now, when we see something non-conceptually, we can see... I, I see a hole, I see a computer, I see what the kind of thing that this is, I'm talking about the object, mm -hmm. kind of thing it is, I see uh, the conventional object, I see the kind of thing it is, I see uh, it as a whole. That, that can be an object known by non-conceptually. Right? Whether I recognize it or not as a computer doesn't matter. Other people would. I, don't, okay. I might not know what it is, that doesn't matter. Okay, now, thinking about so thinking about a computer, now we have different type of uh, generality or categories or whatever. So we have here object mental syntheses and we have or meaning categories and I'm sorry, I'm not really explaining it so uh, clearly. In terms of conceptual thought, we have, first of all, in terms of... Uh, what we're saying here, uh, we have two categories in reference to conventional objects and categories in reference to language. Now, in terms of conventional objects, we have two kinds, which are both referred to by the same word, unfortunately. So, in terms of, you know, when we're thinking, we can think in terms of conventional objects, or we can think in terms of the meaning of words. Those are both referred to by the same word in uh, Tibetan. Okay, so, and these are static phenomena. Alrighty. So let's start with uh, what I call audio categories. I don't think it's uh, here in your list. Jaji. Right. Okay, an audio category. There are, let's say, the word computer. The sound of this word computer. Now, it doesn't matter how loud somebody says. When we hear that word, the sound of that word, there are many, many different uh, variants of what we could hear. It could be in many different voices, male voice, a female voice, child's voice, a computer voice. And so it could be the sound could be pronounced by many different types of voices and many different levels of volume and with many different accents even. And somehow we put that all together into this category of the word computer. This is Otherwise, how do we understand when two people say the same word? How do we understand that they're saying the same thing? The sound isn't the same. All right, so that's an audio category. In order to be able to understand what somebody says, or what different people say, we have to understand it through the filter of an audio category so that somehow we put together all the different variations of the sound that we hear of what we consider the same word. And so that's static. That doesn't change. Now, it's not mentioned in the uh, text or the analysis, but I would think that analogous to this would be if we uh, see the word computer written. It could be written in different colors, different size fonts, different <laughs> handwriting, type, you know, printed letters. Somehow we see it all as 
the word computer, representation of the, word, the written word computer. So I think it's quite similar here. Think about that. I mean, it's really quite amazing how, how we know anything. And even if... <laughs> It's interesting. Even if these these word cat these audio categories don't change, we have to have learned them. You yes. know, as a child, you have to have learned the word computer, and we can be listening to a language that we don't understand, and we can't even put together words from it, can we? Pop Especially it when it's you know spoken very very quickly. We have to learn these. Of course, we could forget them as well. <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever studied a language as a child and not used it very much, then later on in life you don't remember the language at all. Okay? Now, we have this. Uh, now, when we are able to uh, conceptually cognize uh, audio categories, when we, uh, these words, it doesn't necessarily have to be words. We the sound of our car engine. We can either know what it means or not know what it means. So this uh, term here, general, that's translated as general picture, what that means is either a meaning category or an object category. In other words, we could know either what the word means, it's a meaning category, or what object it refers to, that's an object category. It's the same word in Tibetan. So I hear the word computer. Right? Or I learn the word in Zulu for computer. I have no idea what it means. Somebody teaches me the word. They repeat this word. So I repeat this word. Or in Chinese, I repeat the word. No idea what it means. But I can distinguish when two different people say it, you know, in two different voices, I can distinguish that they're saying the same word. I know that they're saying the same word. I have no idea what it means. Or what that word could possibly refer to. Right, so I cognize, I perceive these sounds that these two different people are saying through the medium of an audio category. They're saying the same word. Or I hear several sounds of my car engine. So I know it's a car engine, it's the sound of a car engine, but I don't know that it means that something's not, <laughs> something's wrong with the car. <laughs> I don't know what it means. It's a funny sound. I hear a funny sound. No idea really what it means, but it's a funny sound. So then... <laughs> We could add on top of that, in addition to it, a meaning category and an, or an, and an object category, what it means, what it's referring to. Right? And in many ways, you know, the meaning and the object is, uh, is pretty much the same, although maybe some cases we can differentiate the two. But uh, anyway, I hear this word, computer, and we have a, uh, uh, I know what it means. It's referring to a type of machine that can do this or this and that, and it's referring to this object over here on the table. And as we saw, we could represent in our thought by some sort of, uh, through a specifier, some mental aspect, some hologram that will represent for us, could represent the sound of the word. That's when we have verbal thinking. Has not to be verbal, yeah. I'm thinking computer. And uh, in my mental consciousness, I, what we would describe as I hear in my mind a mental sound of a word computer. You know, what the little voice in our head is saying. <laughs> I mean, that's how it appears. So I'm thinking of the audio category of the word computer, which doesn't have a sound to it. It's a general category in which I could include the way the word is, is said and pronounced by anybody. But when I'm going to actually think it, I'm going to specify down to one particular mental sound, mental hologram sound, that for me is going to represent that category when I'm thinking about it. What, what supposedly I mentally hear, the voice in my head saying, computer. So we have an audio category of a word, we have a sound of a word, and we have a word. These are three different things. Word is a collection synthesis on the syllables. What? Computed on the syllables. Computer. Three syllables. Think about that. What's going on when you say computer in your mind? And mind you, there's no separate little me sitting in the head with a microphone saying it. All these things are just arising. It's just happening.
There's nobody separate from it making it happening, like somebody separate from the computer sitting and typing. Can I ask you about the phenomenon when you... Mm. So we have this situation <laughs> through the computer, connotation changes. And whenever in the future you hear the word computer, do we all think about keep it simple? Okay, so the question is... Uh, <laughs> Basically, now, uh, by association, that uh, when we hear the word computer, we think of the Tibet Centrum, the Tibet Center here in Austria. It's like Pavlov's dog, you know, they hear the bell and then they salivate. <laughs> I, I think a lot of things happen because... Right, things uh, by association happen. This will get into our topic of relationships. Yeah. That's a different topic. <laughs> but uh, actually, we can discuss this in uh, a few minutes when uh, we analyze memory. Because actually, what's involved here is uh, remembering. I mean, there's definitely an inter- right. all these elements. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we have this audio category. It is represented when we're thinking. It can be represented by some mental sound, specific mental sound, not just the general category. And if we know what a a computer is, then together with that audio category, when we're thinking computer, there will also be a meaning category. The meaning category will also refer to an object category, the meaning of what a computer is, and an object that uh, represents it. I'm thinking computer. Okay, so I'm uh, verbally thinking. It doesn't have to be verbally thinking, but uh, if I'm verbally thinking, because I could be just visualizing a computer, but anyway. (laughs) And it's very interesting, actually, if you think about it. (laughs) You know, when you you think 8 plus 7 is 15, you think 8 plus 7 is 15, do you actually have a mental picture of the, of the numbers and a line underneath it and a plus sign and 15? Uh, it's, it's quite interesting. <laughs> I look at these uh, three pens on the table and I am thinking in turn that that's three. Well, there, there are three things here and I'm thinking three, but I don't necessarily have the word three there, but I understand three. And I don't even have to count them. It's very interesting how the mind works, how we know things. Okay, so I'm thinking computers. We have the audio category computer. That could be represented by some mental sound hologram. And I uh, understand what the word means. I'm not just thinking of a meaningless uh, set of sounds. To me, meaningless. Let's say if I were thinking of it in Chinese. And together, so that thought... We have a, this uh, audio category that is there in the thought, plus, at the same time, a meaning category. You know, what the word computer means and the type of the object that it refers to, no. both the meaning and the object. And that could be represented by some visual mental hologram. That's kind or it could be represented by a, another sound one. Mental hologram, the sound of typing, or if we're a blind person, the physical feeling of a computer. Why not? It becomes more interesting. We see more variations. When we start to think in terms of dog, obviously we all think of uh, a different type of dog. Or how about a good time? I'm having a good time. What in the world does that mean? For each of us, that might mean something a little bit different and might be referring to some sort of different object, doesn't it? (laughs) Which for us is a good time. Maybe for somebody else it's not a good time. Is there such a thing as a good time? (laughs) Is there? Well, everybody has a concept of a good time. It doesn't necessarily mean that everybody would label it onto the same thing. It's not the same as a non-existent phenomenon like monster. And then we get into the whole philosophical discussion. Is anything a good time from its own side? Or is it just in terms of uh, our concept of a good time? Mm-hmm. If it were a good time from its own side, everybody <laughs> should consider it a good time. 
you know, we can go to a, what we consider a really boring lecture. If somebody considers it a good time. We consider it a torture. It's not a good time at all to us. There are many, many implications of this, <laughs> which I don't want to go into, but this becomes a very, very deep topic of, uh, uh, in terms of a kind synthesis, you know, of what is it? Can we speak in terms of the object itself as a kind synthesis, or is that also a process of labeling? For me, this thing is a computer. For me, For my, a computer. <laughs> if I have a, uh, a two-year-old son, it's a toy. It's not a computer at all. Have you a two-year-old son? Is this a spielzeug? <laughs> is this a computer? So what is this jetzt wirklich? And who knows what the cat thinks it is? <laughs> so, all right. So, enough of these these uh, generalities or categories. Individual items are individual instances that would fit into any of these categories, and something could fit into a lot of different categories. And with our uh, uh, various uh, Buddhist philosophical systems, then we analyze very carefully, and it's not such an easy topic, whether, where are the defining characteristics that would allow us to uh, correctly put something into this or that category? Mm-hmm. Are the defining characteristics on the side of the object? <laughs> Do they exist only in the dictionary? Did some people make it up? What are defining characteristics? That's not so easy. Not so easy. You know, with the computer, maybe you could say, well, it does this and this and has that and that in it. But what about an emotion? Okay, because we all feel something quite different when we feel love, for example. Hmm. Okay, so with the, since you brought up the topic of uh, memory in association, let us uh, discuss that briefly. Uh, Unfortunately, it's complicated. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When we, uh, first of all, the word memory, remember, recall, mindfulness, they're all the same word in Tibetan and Sanskrit. So we are talking about what it is uh, referring to as like a mental glue. Glue. <laughs> Right. It's a mental glue. It is keeping us fixed on something so that we don't lose hold of it. That's the definition. So we're not talking here about storing information or actually bringing out of the storage you know, a memory. We're talking about when, is actually, when we're actually remembering it. So the example that you used was uh, being here in the Tibet center. So now we're talking about much later, being here in the Tibet Center on this occasion and hearing the discussion of the lost computer. Okay, so now it's presently happening, right? Valid. Later, hearing this uh, discussion is uh, uh, no longer happening. Okay, now having... uh, Oh, this gets really complicated. I'm trying to uh, simplify it a little bit. It is like a tendency, something like a tendency. If we think in terms of uh, uh, anger, we're not angry all the time. So sometimes uh, anger as a mental state, as a mental factor, is manifest. It's actually happening. And sometimes it's just uh, continuing as a tendency. Right? Now, a tendency is one of these uh, changing mental factor, changing phenomenon, that's neither a form of physical phenomenon nor a way of being aware of anything. Also the dance is any... Like time or me. Now, even though it's uh, the word that's used literally means seed, but don't think of it as a, as a, a material object. So, tendency, it's imputed. It's like an abstract uh, phenomenon. I was angry at this time, and after a while I was angry again. After more time I was angry again. So there are all these instances of anger... And how would we put it together? We would say, well, there's a tendency to get angry. It's an abstraction, in a sense, to put it together. So, and each time that we're angry, it's not exactly the same thing, is it? Is it? These are individual instances in this larger category of being angry. 
Right? So here we have another good example of instances and this uh, generality or category. Okay, so it's the same type of thing in terms of remembering. So, I was here listening to this discussion. Also ich war da here at the Tibet Center listening to the discussion. Now, <laughs> later on, I am uh, remembering it. What's going on? Right? So I'm remembering it, and what I have is this general category, is a generality of being at the Tibet Center and hearing this lecture. The general category. And through that, we have a specifier, which is going to get it down to something, and there's going to be a uh, mental hologram arising, which is going to represent for me what it was like to hear this lecture, to be here and hear the lecture. And what's interesting is each time I remember being here, the mental hologram that represents it, that appears, is different, isn't it? I remember something else about it. Don't always remember exactly the same thing, do I? But we put it all together into this general thing. I remember being here. And so and we're not remembering it all the time. We're not mindful of it. Remembering is mindful. So we don't have a mental glue on this, with this conceptual thought, holding on to this generality, this category of being here and something representing it. Also, wie vergehen? When we're remembering it, is the mental glue holding on to it. That's mindfulness. When we're remembering mm -hmm. it, is a mental glue holding on to it. All right, holding up to the generality, being here, and some mental representation. Both. Also, the mental hologram? Both. You have the general category, also, and through it, we're specifying it by representing it with a some sort of mental picture. It could be something vis mentally visual. It could be something, you know, remembering the sound of my voice. It could be, you know, anything. I remember being confused. You, you can remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> that you'll remember. <laughs> so, how do we put it together? We bring it together. It comes to a complete picture. Right, it would never be exactly the same picture because it's no longer happening. We could never actually remember ex what was no, what's no longer happening. That's, no, that's valid. It's expired. It's like our milk that has gone bad. It's finished. And we would say that we have a tendency to remember. It's the same word. I mean, this in the West we would say is a memory, but we're not talking about some engram printed somewhere in your head. Although maybe there is a physical counterpart to this. You know, we're not discounting that. But in Buddhism we're not talking about the... You know, the engram. But we're not denying that. That's not contradictory to what we're talking about. In Buddhism, we're always talking about from what's happening from the experience point of view. What are you experiencing? You know, we're not describing all these things chemically. So, there's a tendency. Now, what would be the circumstance that would cause from that tendency to have a moment of actually remembering it? It could be hearing the word computer could trigger it. That would be the circumstance as part of our discussion of causality. And it would be an immediately preceding condition. Immediately preceding thinking about and remembering being here is hearing the word computer, like the dog hearing the bell. Pretty neat, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and not every dog hears the bell. And not every dog hears the bell. And not everybody remembers being here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and every time that I hear the word computer, I might experience something completely different. I might not think of it being here at all. Now, it becomes a very interesting question, which I can't really answer immediately off the top of my head. But why, for certain people... Hearing the word computer will trigger remembering being here, and for other people it won't. Mm -hmm. That probably has to do with all the emotions, Intensive. attachment, uh, how strong these emotions were, confusion, etc. at the time, in order to, what we would say in our Western languages, make a big impression on us. It also might lead to the point that we sometimes, tendency is also something that protects us, we have to move on. If we stayed in the mind of permanent remembrance of this moment, we would never say this class is... Right, but let her first translate what I said, if she can remember. <laughs> yeah, if I can remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Or if you're going to have an examination the next day, there's a lot of pressure, so you remember something better. But uh, your point in this uh, question, I must say, I don't quite understand. Can you express it uh, again, please? Uh, you said that the memory is a sort of mental glue. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we do, we do forget. We are not remembering everything that we experienced in the past the whole time. So maybe this tendency is also something that our mind or whatever protects us for, from getting stuck into, in a certain moment or in a, in a state of mind. We, if, if we would not uh, move on, and our, we always would remember only this moment we are in. We would, we would not move on. We would not, if we, we would not moving on. We would not, not move on if we said this class is not finished. Right. Okay. So this is quite interesting. What he's saying is that if we didn't have these gaps of uh, between remembering things, when it's a tendency. The gap would be the time of when there's a tendency that we're not thinking it, we're not remembering it. If there weren't those gaps, we would be remembering it all the time. And if we remembered it all the time, for those of us who are not Buddhas, who can't handle being aware of everything simultaneously, <laughs> Buddhas are, remember everything all the time, you know, simultaneously. But besides that, you know, remembering past lives, all these sort of things. But uh, for us ordinary beings, then uh, he's saying, isn't this some sort of protection mechanism that there are these gaps? Otherwise, we would remember everything all the time. Mm-hmm. And this would cause a, com- a huge confusion. It would it cause a huge be- confusion. To- to- right. Now, I, I would say that it is not a conscious uh, defense mechanism. Okay. It's not that we're purposely doing this, that we're purposely forgetting, but, uh, and only certain things will trigger the memory. Remember, when we are remembering something, what it is is we are, with mental glue, we are holding on to something similar to what happened to the pa- in the past, but that represents it, resembles it. But we don't have perfect mindfulness, meaning that our mental glue is pretty weak, and uh, we get distracted, and uh, the mental glue loosens, and we stop remembering, we forget. Forget means to stop remembering. Our Western concept of forget is a little bit different from the Buddhist concept of forget. I forget it means I can never remember it. Forget it just means, like in the uh, context of uh, trying to concentrate on something, my mind wanders, so I've forgotten to focus on the object. Mindfulness is weak, so I have to bring my attention back. Although we may think that we've really forgotten something, but... Later on in life, something might trigger it, and we remember it again. That happens, doesn't it? Oh, I forgot that happened. You know, somebody reminds us what we did when we were in high school, 40 years ago. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember that. It's very interesting when uh, they remember something that we don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember saying that. I don't remember doing that. So who knows whose memory is accurate? <laughs> So uh, the mental representation may not be very accurate. Right, no, well, let me finish what I was saying. <laughs> let me finish what I was saying is that the, the fact that we no longer, you know, remember, it's not that it's a, that we have this tendency, is not because of some defense mechanism, it's because there's a fault in our mindfulness that we can't hold on to it. If we had perfect mindfulness, we could hold on for as long as we want. And we don't have perfect mindfulness. We don't have control over that. Yet, we could. And if we did have control over it, then we could say, you know, my session of remembering it is finished. We stop thinking about it. And it doesn't just sort of come back because we are thinking, you know, doing something else. That's a very advanced state, isn't it? I'm not going to think about there's a monster in the closet. I mean, very difficult to do. (laughs) If it were really good, our mindfulness, we could stay mindful of something like focusing on an object for as long as we wanted, and when we decided that that we wanted to stop being mindful of it, we would stop, and we would no longer think about it. For us, that's very difficult. 
I was in this relationship with someone and we broke up and I'm thinking about it. Am I really capable of saying now I'm going, you know, I thought about it for five minutes. Now I'm not going to think about it anymore. <laughs> not going to remember it. We can't do that. But if we really had developed minds, we would be able to be mindful of something for a certain period of time and then stop it. And if we were a Buddha, we'd be able to continue mindfulness of everything forever and not be confused. Now, you had one specific question, and then we will finish this session. Then we will have our question session. So does this fit into the category of the question session, or does this fit into the category of the lecture? It's very interesting. It's also interesting. Also, it gehört das jetzt zur Kategorie der. Vice versa, that the question provokes the lecture, and vice versa. I don't have to ask questions now. Good. Then let's take our break.